Thank you. So we've just heard for, from several investors, and we also brought here uh, Matt, who's representing the entrepreneurial side. But also, there are also venture builders on stage, and, and, and Joe is also involved in building companies. So I feel we have a, a good mix of investors and, and founders. As of myself, I'm co-founder with Reason and Repair Biotechnologies. And I've also done some angel investments in the space, about 10 companies. Uh, some of them are here and presented. So I also have some experience in both areas. Uh, maybe we can start with like a question that's typically asked, but I, I don't think we've talked enough in th this conference is, what areas in aging are like most over-invested and maybe too many companies already and some areas that are, are not? I think that when you're, when you exist in a world that is primarily preclinical uh, stage companies, there's no such thing as overinvesting in approaches. Um, the more shots on goal that we can take, the better off we will be. And so even when there are things like, um, for example, multiple approaches targeting P53 and FOXO4 and senescent cells, which is a topic that I care a lot about, um, I'm really happy to see multiple approaches here because the likelihood of, um, of kind of maneuvering our way to get to the one team, that, to Joe's point, will execute correctly, make it all the way through to the clinic. Um, you know, if we have more than one, there's plenty of room in each of these spaces to, to uh, have multiple drugs succeed, and, and not all efforts are going to make it. Um, I think that it's just important that we don't too much follow a herd mentality of like everyone piling into Synalytics or everyone piling into reprogramming or what, what have you. Keep, like what Sri was talking about, keep this diversified portfolio approach in your mind when you think about aging because aging is a multivariate problem um, and it's not going to have one-shot solutions. Bringing in the tech side, I mean, like think about, uh, first there was Friendster, remember that? No? Okay, too bad. Um, too bad for Friendster. Yeah, then there was MySpace. Uh, I didn't make it either. So people had to keep trying until we got Facebook. Uh, and then it became like the, what, fourth largest company in the entire world. So uh, yeah, it's worth t trying a few shots at it. Yeah, I, I, I sort of think there an, it's, it's data and science which drives investment in, or overinvestment, as you say, in certain areas. So if the science is mature in one approach or in one area, one hallmark of aging, you'd see a lot more investment going into that area, which I think is totally fine, till the data tells you to not do any more investment, in which case it moves on to the next area. So um, I, at this point in time, I probably see senescence as one of the areas which probably every, which is on everyone's lips, driven more by successes, or should I say more of a clinical um, uh, presence for unity, and that's driven a lot more investments into other companies which are looking to follow in that realm. Though, Matt, you should talk more about that area since, <laughs> since, since, it's, since it's your, your scene. Um, as for the other areas, I would imagine the same thing would happen. It would happen in cycles. Yeah, I think that uh, there are two aspects to it. Uh, one is that um, uh, it would be very, very good if any of those startups uh, has a successful drug, no matter in what area it is that would push the market forward. And the other thing is that, I mean, we should remember every high-tech market has a hype cycle. So as, as George just said, you can uh, extend that list like uh, Excite, Lycos, um, and you name it, so many companies that were the hot shots in the internet in the beginning and nobody knows about them anymore. So usually it's that you get a big hype cycle and then you get a big crash and after the crash the real companies are built. So um, uh, yeah, you can do investments right now but I, I don't think we should get the hopes up too much that, that uh, these are going the big ones. I think it requires the market to mature a bit so that we also get, found, founders is an issue, we need more mature founders in the market and these will be, build the big companies in the end. Yeah. Uh, and Michael, in that regard, what are your thoughts? We've heard from James uh, on valuations in terms of different stages from seed to uh, public companies. How do you think they are changing and do you find them still attractive or maybe overvalued? Excuse me. Uh, valuation from seed to 
uh, up to public companies? What are well, uh, actually, the market is so young, I think there's not a real feeling for what is, what is the real value for the companies right now. So I think this, this uh, also has to develop because right now these are all, uh, uh, these are not priced rounds, so they are, they are just convertibles. So the real, in the beginning, the real value of the companies um, is to be defined when the real VCs come in in the end and not, not, not by the convertible. You can well, put any number on there, whether it's 5 million, 50 million, or 20 million. Um, uh, once you make a price round, then the, there's, the, there's the proof in the pudding. Yeah. On price, I mean, we're talking about a marketplace. So the prices, the valuations basically that companies are commanding are exactly the prices. That's the right price right now, by definition. Um, and in terms of, um, uh, Matt, since you haven't uh, spoken yet, what do you think, we've, we've heard from like what investors want from entrepreneurs and what, what do you want from investors that you're not seeing? question. I think uh, over the past uh, really decade, if you look at uh, you know, gene therapy in particular, but uh, in, in aging, you've seen a, a whole bunch more smaller investors come in earlier. And I think this is generally a good thing. If you uh, look at uh, the money we've raised with uh, Ocean and Oncocenex, the majority of it's come from like high net worth individuals, not from traditional funds. And I, I think that's good in that it's allowed a lot of ideas that were pretty far outside of the box to, to actually come forward and start generating proof of concept data. What I'm looking for now is who's going to step up to cover the clinical trials for this? Because uh, there's been an interesting trend in that a lot of the VCs started going earlier and earlier and then started building their own companies and, and, do, and were doing like mega rounds, like arch style stuff. Um, and then you have uh, these companies like, you know, Life and Apollo. And, who are like basically bringing founding companies as they go and so what it's kind of left uh, in the wake is a uh, I guess a, a valley of death of sorts that has been pushed into a new location so we had people effectively throwing money at this when we started like it, it was really pretty easy to raise the early money for it but uh, but getting into the clinic itself is a much bigger raise and requires a different set of investors and I think that's uh, that's the, the gap that I'd like to see more of so that's exactly why I wanted to move to a bigger fund um, and why I created Kronos was, was exactly to account for that problem. I think that this, the seed capital is there for this space. There's so much excitement in it. But um, one of the reasons that I wanted to show this overview in, in my talk of like the biopharma space is that most of these startup companies are backed by these expert biopharma VCs. And there needs to be a bridge between the first five million check that you get to develop your technology and that 35 million round there. And I, I think that that's the space that I'm most excited to see develop on the financing and investing side over the next five years. That's sweet, I love it. Um, maybe if the other investors could comment on like, where, where do you see these like 10 plus million dollar rounds coming from since even high net worth individuals cannot uh, do that size of rounds? I'm seeing, I'm seeing tech investors make investments like that now. Um, you know, you look at uh, Andreessen Horowitz, they're writing big checks now. Kosla uh, uh, writes bigger checks. Um, uh, Charles River says they're going to be writing bigger checks. Uh, DCVC is stepping up. Uh, there's more and more tech people who are willing to do it. And it's not just, you know, the Column Group and Third Rock um, and Arch. Uh, but Part of it is, is the price that people are willing to pay. And I think that, that uh, you know, the, the third rocks of the world, they, you know, or 5AMs or whoever, they like to fund, they'll fund a clinical trial. Uh, they're used to getting 80% of a company for funding a clinical trial. Uh, now they have, they're, they're looking at this, this sort of mouse in the snake progressing its way toward the clinic and they're, uh, the founders, uh, you know, they, they, they do a first round in a normal tech way, which is the founders own 100% of the company and then they, they do their first round and they, after that they own 75% of the company. Uh, and that's just weird to the biotech VCs. They're, wait a minute, you're not supposed to own 75%. We're supposed to own 75%. And um, so if they run out of money from the tech world to fund clinical trials, then I think the main effect is just that the prices will go down and the founders will have to give up some equity. But if you have a good asset, that's worth trying, 
you'll get it there. I, I, I think the issue that Matt mentioned is probably exaggerated in the aging research field as opposed to regular biotech, right? And that's, it's, it's more of a gap there because you don't have your regular VCs playing in that as much. Um, for me, the way to solve that gap is how do you get the regular VCs who are, why, why isn't Orbimed coming in there and why are, why are players like that not coming in there? Why isn't corporate VC playing in that space? Because that is a sweet spot for a corporate VC to be playing and you have a, a bit, gives them an opportunity to use their balance sheet to invest in that versus not having it on their portfolio or having to show it on their P&L and then have the option to acquire later. It's a super cool place to play. But you need to make that argument for a pharma company to be interested. So uh, I think, and this is something that I always see, there's this divide between these meetings and the pharma meetings, and you need, we need to bring those closer together so the mainstream comes to us and we are part of the mainstream, yeah? I think we, we, we have to, 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 uh, to, to keep in mind that we're not talking biotech here in general, but rejuvenation biotech, which is going to be a, the biggest market on this planet ever. Uh, and it's going to be something totally new, and it's going to have totally different dynamics from uh, just biotech. So, um, I mean, if you do a, a, a simple calculation, um, what would people be willing to pay for not getting cancer, not, not getting uh, age-related diseases, not aging at all? Let's say that's $10,000 a year. Is that reasonable? So multiply this with 3 billion people on the planet who want to have the treatment. So that's 30 trillion a year just for the basic treatments and then add service on top of that. So this is such a huge industry. And I think we're going to see different players in there than um, over the time that has to develop. But I think we cannot just say, well, or, uh, unfortunately, it's not just the, bi the current biotech VCs. It's not the pharma companies. Um, it's going to be totally different players in that market. It's going to be probably the people who spend uh, vision funds. The vision funds are going to put the money in there uh, because they're going to realize what the market is going to be, the size. And, and given this potential size, so what are, what are they waiting for? Uh, for results. Simply results. Proof that it's working. This is what the whole world is doesn't know that it's waiting for, but this is, this is why I said initially, we need some therapy to work that people understand this is real. It's not science fiction, it's not hypothetical, it's really working. And then all of a sudden they will see, okay, there are the hallmarks of aging, it's not only senolytics, it's all the other things that could be done, and then the money will flow in. If, if I can ask that question, so what's the path to get to these results, right? What would the end point look like? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what my thought process is, and I'd love to hear. So for me, this would start with age-related diseases as we know them. I don't know if we're going to have one uh, 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 panacea which is going to, in the next five years, come to the market, be approved, and be an aging, anti-aging drug. But what I do believe is across all of these approaches, we would probably come up with one or two therapeutics which would, but which would target, let's say, age-related macular degeneration or maybe another cause of blindness, but it's coming through an autophagy approach or through a senescence approach, which would drive increased interest in these approaches. And over time, the collaboration across these approaches will possibly create the market. That okay, I, if, if, I, if I could have a wish, I would wish it work totally different. I think that the celebrities will go to an offshore clinic and get some rejuvenation treatment and return, and you have it all over the yellow press that they just feel 10 years younger or 15 years younger. And uh, that's, I mean, uh, if you see the story how, how the, uh, the German wall came down, it's not that they turned the wall down, but, but people from Eastern Germany all went to Hungary on vacation, and then they drove to Western Germany. So they just drove around the wall, and then the, 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 there was no need for the wall anymore. And I think we need celebrities like saying, oh, I got this analytic treatment, I'm like 10 years younger, my skin is better or whatever. And this is going to be the real change, that we cure macular de de uh, degeneration is not going to move the general public. It's not, not going to move the imagination of people. So, so maybe we need like more focus on aesthetic uh, uses of like, there are a couple of companies, for example, using analytics, they're trying to for skin and wrinkles and also uh, glucosapain. 
Right now, it's it's something like an eight or ten billion dollar market uh, for anti aging stuff that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> oh, okay. Depending on how you define it, maybe it's even a hundred plus billion. Uh, so, so, uh, so uh, you know, ima imagine how that will change when it actually works. I think that'll be pretty interesting. I think that highlights like most people that buy these supplements. Many of them are like for weight loss. Uh, wrinkles, muscle gain, which are more, it's hard to think about like longer term, right? People want to be more attractive, things like that o over the short term. I have one thing to add on this. So one of the other important considerations when we talk about uh, the potential size of this rejuvenation biotech or uh, longevity biotech industry is investment timelines. Um, there are groups like, um, you know, family offices or, or evergreen funds, uh, vision funds that in, are investing on a very, very long timeline. They're comfortable looking out 15 years, 20 years in the future. Um, as a VC investor, I like to think of myself as a long-term investor uh, because I come in early and I want to be there through the entire growth of the company, but I still have a cap, right? I ultimately have to deliver a return for my investors, and that return has to come in five, six years. Um, and so when I go up one stage of who's going to be working with me to, to commercialize those assets, the pharma companies are looking for an even faster turnaround. Right? They're not investing for 15 years in the future. They're like, does this fill my pipeline, and what are the sales going to be, and how much is the insurance company going to reimburse? So until we can answer all of those questions from reimbursement to pricing to what clinical trial, it, that flows down all the way to the VC level and, and, and the investment level. And, and I think that a lot of those dominoes really have to fall uh, in order to, to come together to make these long-term investments happen, uh, which is why I, I'm a strong advocate of the incrementalist approach that Sri is talking about, going for one disease first, um, uh, approving something this way and then letting that that 15 year vision that not enough people are pursuing organically come together through short term self interest yeah, I, I totally agree it's going to be a time of transition we have the biotech market now it's the only one we have and then we have the biotech VCs um, I was just talking about the long term uh, vision because uh, with the real big money might have the long term vision and then if it, if it comes in, the market's going to change. So it's, it's, I think we have to be very dynamic and all, uh, adapting the strategy from year to year on, on going forward. Um, and James, could you talk a bit about, like, and this is a question for all people here, why you believe your model of venture building is, is better than, say, a founder-led or corporate, something else? This should be a fun question then because we have six different people who are all kind of building portfolio approaches on this stage, and all six of us are taking quite different approaches to, uh, to, to that. Um, so I am fundamentally skeptical that each individual drug that I fall in love with will ultimately be a human medicine. And what I look for in constructing a, a model for venture building is having the, a team with the humility that says, all right, this is probably not going to work. And m most venture capital companies, including biotech venture capital companies asking for very low valuations, lose money, right? The, 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 mean, the mean return of a VC is negative, even biotech, even though it's doing very well. And so I very much like this venture building approach both because I think that it keeps the, the risk calculations of the early stage in a, in a very optimistic environment controlled in the early stages. We can kind of keep the over-exuberance down a little bit, um, but also because, uh, as I described in, in my talk, I love this enduring model of a vision for a company led by an, an investor and a scientist and sometimes a founder there as well. Um, which is very different than a lot of the approaches that you guys uh, believe in, wh which I also think is fine, right? And the new fund, I'm half and half. Uh, but, but I love this enduring vision of like a 
VC has a hypothesis that they want to pursue, a founder has a hypothesis or a, some, some data that they've come up with, and those two people are the anchors around which a company is built, and then whoever needs to be leading it at any given time, whether that's uh, a drug development person or a clinical person or whatever, I think is a great model that's shown a track record of success. How do you keep the uh, founders and top people aligned in terms of, we see on uh, in these S1s like f scientific founders staying with less than 1% stage of IPO and even founders very low percentages. Um, so I have, to, I have to be the rep for the entire traditional VC industry. Um, <laughs> The, sh the short answer to that question is I think that thanks to the entrance of, of this second San Francisco model of biotech companies, those numbers are going to need to change because people are better understanding their worth. So we pay our founders, CEOs, and scientists a lot more than that uh, in, in terms of shares. Um, that's one of the ways that I snipe deals from other traditional biotech investors. Um, and, and I think that that will continue to change and there will be an equilibrium in the market. Um, but I also think that the 75%, like Mark Zuckerberg controlling Facebook, even though it's the fifth, fourth largest company in the world, I don't think that's necessary for scientists that took the first step um, or the, the CEO that founded the company and did the initial talk studies. I think that there is a reasonable distribution that involves, um, let's say, you know, percentages where the investors over the long term are controlling the large part of the company, not the single seed investor, but like the people who bankroll the 200 million that it takes to go from phase zero to phase three uh, will control the majority, the, the large majority of that company over that time uh, and still give a substantial upside to the founders. Uh, without putting specific numbers on it, that's the best I can do to say. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's not too bad and it will get better. Yeah, and I think it makes sense in terms of historically, at least most, most data show that uh, biotech VCs had higher average returns than tech VCs. And that's probably why, because they had a, a larger... Very, very different models. Very, very different models between, between tech VCs and biotech VCs. But that data is correct. Biotech VCs do, in general, get higher median returns. Uh, so, Matt, maybe if you can argue yeah. why founders should keep 75%. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh... <laughs> I, I think I'm maybe a, a weird hybrid in uh, that e even though I have spent my life basically being a, a founding CEO, I, uh, I tend to gravitate towards platforms uh, more than specific uh, molecules. And uh, I think, the, I guess, if you're considering the advantage of a founder-started company versus a VC-started one, I think part of it comes down to kind of the the passion and the vision for it. So for me, my background was not in biology, it was in computer science, and I got into biology at this North Star that the essence of life is information. And that just like you don't debug word by changing microchips, you shouldn't try to like deal with disease by monkeying with the chemical underpinnings of life. And so like this general focus and mission led me to track down technologies, pull them together, and and build things based on that. And like it given that they're platforms, they still kind of make allowance for the fact that any given one shot at it might not be great. So you carefully choose one that can you know, prove the concept and, and then build from it. But uh, I, I worry, you know, the, there's no substitute for being in the trenches. And uh, you know, part of me maybe wishes I was on the investing side, I'd probably have more hair and uh, you know, sleep better. But, uh, but there is th this distinction that it, you eat, sleep, and breathe this one thing. I'm, I'm not one company out of a portfolio. It, this is a vision, and, and I think that, I mean, if you look at the stats about why would an outsourced drug fare better than a pharma bill drug, it's because it was built by someone who, like, that was their singular focus, and they said, I'm gonna take this thing into the clinic, and when we started the first gene therapy company, gene therapy is a bad word, like no one was doing this. It was absolutely out, and I, I like to operate in the space where it's still kind of viewed as crazy. And that's not exactly where VCs like to operate. They like to operate in the spot where a few of their fun friends already made money on it, and uh, that they're not crazy. And so uh, and I think that there, you will never see venture-created companies, I think, rival the uh, raw innovation of a founder-started company. Not to say that they can't make a bunch of money for their LPs and, and do great things, but uh, but it's not a substitute for the passion that originated it. For, for our goal as a community, <laughs> which we are already established by poll, uh, is furthering a mission. Uh, it isn't necessarily just how to get 
you know, 11% returns instead of 8% returns or whatever. Um, it's how to take things that people think are crazy right now and make huge successes out of them and, and save lots of lives. So we need crazy people. We're thinking about it slightly differently when we think about our scientific founders, and it's not just about a percentage here and there, right? I mean, we're looking at solving or, or doing two things for them. One, um, intellectually, they have the, uh, they're stimulated enough, and they have the opportunity to see a therapy advance, number one. Number two, they get the returns, and this are this the pure returns, and we reduce the risk on the returns that they get. If they're focused on one asset, and if that asset doesn't work, that scientific founder who was working on that asset um, doesn't get to make anything out of it, whether, it, whether they own 2% of it or whether they own 40% of it. But through a diversified approach, if I have six scientific founders working on different approaches, and each of them is actually vested in the other approaches as well, and gets the opportunity to work with the other six scientific leaders in the field, uh, that's a much, that's a completely different dynamic, which allows for that intellectual stimulation and the camaraderie and their ability to work as a group towards a shared goal, plus gets you a better chance of those returns that we're talking about, whether it's two person. At some, some level, it doesn't really matter. This is a sort of binary. Yeah, I also think that in, in the end, it's going to be a mix with the, between the tech and the biotech um, investment model, um, because I also think the founders have, should have much more shares in, in the company, especially when, when, when starting. On the other hand, the big difference to, to the tech world is that in the tech world, even if, if your startup doesn't go that well, you could still sell it because it still has something where you build up. And, uh, and uh, if your startup is growing over time, it, it increases the, visibly the value because you have more user, more revenue, whatever. And maybe your, your growth flattens at some time, but still there's value. <laughs> With rejuvenation biotech, I mean, if your phase three fails, your value is zero. And so that means all the money that you invested is lost. So um, there is much more risk involved in that. So this has also to be reflected in there. So I think it's going to be a mix in the end. So more shares for the founders, but not as much in the as in the tech industry. OK. We've talked a lot about from the institutional investor point of view. Maybe like what can a regular investor do to further, further the aging cause? Uh, assume he's not an accredited investor. He cannot invest in a fund. What, what can he do? And this is a question for, for everyone. Can he do anything? If you want to further the course, you don't have to go with the mainstream, then go for the stuff that should be done. For example, fund new categories of, of, of therapies. I mean, everybody's going for analytics, but there are much more hallmarks. Or if you follow the sense approach, there are so many more things that should be done. Um, I would focus my philanthropic investment money um, uh, if I want to further the course in, in, in places that are, that are not covered um, with the hope to, well, open a new category. I mean, imagine somebody doing like something with mitochondrials or so, um, uh, and then uh, focus um, and, and focus on something like this and, and get um, new people into the market and, and um, new startups going. Um, yeah, further some of that a little bit um, by adding that picking stocks is a good way to lose money um, for, for non-expert investors uh, and for expert investors. <laughs> and, and so, well, I think that this space as a whole has enormous potential. Uh, like Michael was, was saying before, we don't know if the public companies are going to be the Facebooks or the, My, or the MySpaces or Friendster. Friendster. Yeah. Um, or Pets.com or whatever. <laughs> and, and so if you restrict your portfolio to only the things that have gone public, um, I think that you have a very limited window to, to go from. Um, and I, I would say that it, for people who really, really want to be uh, involved coming into this space, I think there are two great models to follow. One is to do what Bill did and meet a lot of people in the space who are founding companies and make investments, um, which I guess you have to be a accredited investor for, but not in a friends and family round necessarily. It depends if they're coming to you or you're going to them. Um, but then the second thing to do is to like say, what can I really 
do to create value and go and like become a founder or enable a founder or put people together or you know, I have a, a friend um, that probably many of you guys know, Kevin Perra, uh, who was running a really successful business in Canada. And he was like, I'm going to drop everything and go get a PhD in, you know, in his 40s to, to go do this. And, and just having that kind of I will do something attitude means a lot in this space. And I think it's more than you're going to get by saying, I want to invest in this space as a non-accredited investor. And, and Kevin's founding a company now. That's right. There you go. <laughs> I would say, actually, if, if you want to separate the uh, goal of making money from helping the space, uh, it's worth making a distinction that uh, perhaps the best way to do both is to start a company. Um, I mean, for there, there's so much science and so many ideas that just sit there languishing between the ears of some guy in a lab, that uh, some woman in a lab, some, some person in a lab, that, that never sees the light of day. And uh, it, what it's funny, so the first uh, biotech I started, had, no background in bio, hadn't had a biology class since junior high school. I strolled into Caltech and got worldwide exclusive rights to some tech from a Nobel laureate. And it's mind boggling that I was able to get away with that. The, I mean, the, the only way I got away with it was because I did it unchallenged. Like, there, no one else was after the technology, so they're like, yeah, sure, like, here's your option, have fun. And uh, I think that people underestimate what you can do at the grassroots level. Like, I, I mean, I spent a bit time building an open source in vivo electroprator to do gene therapy in the garage. Like a, a tool that literally lets you, you know, write programs in the code of life and upload it to flesh and blood. And there's so many, the technology is advanced to the point that you can do really wild stuff with a very minimal budget. And if, if you're looking to make an impact on the space, uh, there's a ton of room to operate in. I, I just want to elaborate on, on one little piece when you're talking about a guy in a lab or a girl in a lab. Um, one of the other things is that biotech is enormously underrepresented for female founders. Um, we have six people on this stage, uh, all of which are dudes. Um, but actually, female founders, both in biotech and tech, uh, deliver better returns than guys. And so one of the things when I look at founders, both founding scientists and founding entrepreneurs, uh, is that if a, if a woman is coming to me um, to pitch, I look at that more favorably in, in some ways because the data is actually there to back up women founders and women are less likely to start companies unless they're really, really sure that it's going to succeed. So my advice to any women who are considering doing this in the audience, either as scientists or as entrepreneurs, is you should definitely do it. Yeah, so uh, anecdotal, I have a, like a biotech CEO support group slash drinking club in Seattle. Um, and uh, <laughs> and it, it started out as a mix of about like uh, actually half guys and half girls. And uh, halfway through it, uh, like I ended up being the only guy. Like the, the ones left standing were all the women CEOs, actually. It's pretty wild. And now we're starting to rebalance. But uh, um, yeah, the success record is pretty remarkable. I think maybe it's a little less uh, bullshitting uh, coming out of women in general. <laughs> Guys exactly. are good at bullshitting. The story of this panel, don't trust us. <laughs> uh, so we've heard that, that like there's a lot of money in this space and we sh everyone should start a company, but there are some areas like uh, Alzheimer's that it's very hard to get fundraising. So what would be like a potential solution or solutions for like spaces where it's hard or mitochondrial diseases? What do you guys think? Too much time. Do one of you guys want to jump in on that one? Well, I just helped someone raise $10 million for a mitochondria startup um, like three weeks ago. So it's not not that hard of a space, but it depends on what you have. Um, great founder, awesome science. Um, you're gonna you're gonna find funding one way or another. Um, you can also uh, ultimately make it about something else than you know if you have an if you're an Alzheimer's startup but you're using an aging pathway, uh, the, the definition of an aging pathway is that there are multiple downstream diseases that are affected by it. So, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know. I, y yesterday, one of, the, one of the speakers was talking about how, uh, uh, oh, how the, uh, the NIA uh, or the NIH will change their focus areas, you know, and sometimes they're, they're um, funding a particular enzyme kind of chemistry is there as one of the hot things that they want to pour money into and suddenly all this all the scientists seem to be a specialist in that particular area and then they start getting grants there um, 
So uh, you know, if there's if there's a desert on quote Alzheimer's, then uh, find something else that this same aging pathway uh, has an effect on and and um, fundraise for that. No, I'd echo that. I'd, I'd look at it in two ways, right? One is I don't see pharma coming in and putting in money into very, very early Alzheimer's research. It just was not going to happen, given all of the failures now. So I would say there's, there are other sources of funds, but potentially the Alzheimer's Discovery Foundation and the foundations which might be interested in that area. That's one, right? You probably need that to get to a place where you have enough data that you can interest far more with. Even then, it's going to be hard. The second way is what Joe was getting to. Pick an orphan disease, pick something which where you believe the science is still applicable, get to a proof of concept there, get that into the clinic, and you see Alzheimer's as a second indication coming in there. And now that's a better story I can take to a pharma who know that at least the Alzheimer's piece is still the second uh, it's the second way, but you already have something which is going to go to the clinic and which has value. The, the thing that I would want to add here, specifically in the Alzheimer's space, um, is that, uh, yeah, without, without echoing what you guys have said, which I think is absolutely correct, but particularly in the Alzheimer's space, there's something very special about the relationship between the longevity biotech world and Alzheimer's. Uh, in fact, I think that if you think of these as two non-connecting of like traditional pharma and longevity biotech as non-overlapping Venn diagrams that are moving towards each other, the first place that I think they're really going to kiss in complete alignment is in the Alzheimer's space. Because there have been so many failed trials for amyloid antibodies, when you talk to the scientists behind these trials, what they're saying is, we have to go earlier, we have to go earlier, we have to like understand prevention and treat upstream causes of the disease. Nobody's really saying that for cancer, and nobody's really doing too much more than statins on that for atherosclerosis and, and, and heart disease. And so if we can create drugs, which will go through orphan pathways first and achieve clinical validation in non-Alzheimer's indications, but have the potential to enter the marketplace as prophylactics for Alzheimer's disease, I think that's going to be one of these like milestones that Michael was talking about, where people wake up and they're like, wait, what? There's a drug that I can take that will prevent Alzheimer's disease, and it might also prevent my cancer risk, and it will also cure my diabetes. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> and, and so I think that when you asked Shri about endpoints for some of the key clinical trials, I'm expecting that early stage Alzheimer's endpoints, not five years from now, but 10 to 15 years from now, after you've gotten clinical proof of concept with other indications first, will be when this space explodes into the big pharma world. That's just an unfounded prediction. Um, <laughs> we're recording now, so uh, we'll, 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 we'll be playing this back. And, uh, <laughs> um, I think we have a few minutes left, so what, what could government do differently in terms of, like, something that's likely to happen, like, in the next five years, not something extremely, like, impossible? Well, be behind my, my thesis is the or bias is that we need more founders in the ecosystem. And there are a bunch of people on the front row who, who said, yeah, I want to found. Um, so I'm really curious uh, how we can help these people uh, get into this space. Um, is that an applicable topic? Uh, one thing that I've noticed that, like, to found a tech company, there's a lot of uh, resources on the internet to even YC, right, mm -hmm. provides a lot of... Uh, yeah e-books, stuff like this, videos, but there's not that for biotech yet. I don't think that comprehensive, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely true. Um, we are acquiring more bio uh, resources, at least in, in, from the perspective of YC as a particular investor. Um, we just brought in a brand new full-time bio founder, um, and we have more bio uh, advisors so, and so on in the network. and more and more companies now. And part of the value of YC and, and other networks like that is that the founders all support each other. Um, you, there's like, what, about 2,000 startups now uh, and, the, and the founders from those who will all jump up and help you if you're in need and you publish on an internal blog. 
Uh, and uh, similarly, in the biospace in Silicon Valley, there's a ton of founders who know each other, help each other, talk to each other, give each other uh, hints and tips. And so if you just come out uh, to Silicon Valley, uh, my home, or probably Boston as well, um, and uh, go to the meetups and uh, go uh, socialize at the Series A parties and, and the, you know, all, all the different um, things going on, the venture capital group dinners and talks and that kind of thing, you will also absorb the information. You don't have to just get it in final digested form from a textbook when it's 10 years old. So when I, I have uh, some very first-hand experience uh, starting a company in this, knowing nothing about it. And uh, I did something that uh, I think a lot of first-time founders don't do, and that's I went to every biotech event I could find in, in Seattle and told anyone who would listen my plan. And, uh, and fortunately for me, uh, academics uh, don't usually hold back when they think it's stupid. And so like, uh, it just get you know, ripped apart repeatedly. Um, but uh, kept, kept doing it until eventually people didn't have reasons why it wouldn't work, and then we got funded. But uh, I think one of the, the easiest things you can do is simply show up where other people are, are like that and start talking about it. And, a lot of times, especially first-time founders, are so secretive, and academic ones are the worst. Like, they, they don't want to tell anyone their thing. They want you to sign, like, a 50-page NDA before they tell you what the idea is. And I was like, this is retarded. Like, you will never get anywhere this way. And so tell everybody about it, because in the end, like, no one steals these ideas. I mean, for, in my case, they thought it was a bad idea. That's why I didn't steal it. But, uh, <laughs> but at this point, uh, they can't steal it because they don't know how. And so uh, I think if you're an expert in something like that, don't, don't hesitate to share it with everyone and, and take that feedback. You know, back, back to my thesis, thank you. Um, back to my thesis, th there's a dearth of founders. So if you go out and talk, to your, talk about your idea, and it's the, one of the biggest rookie mistakes out there is that people are like, oh, I don't want to talk about my idea. Talk about my idea, someone's going to steal it. Like, everybody's busy doing something else, and, and almost nobody actually wants to found a company. Uh, so if, you, if you're talking to people about your idea, they're happy to tell you what's wrong with other people's stuff because that's low risk for them. Um, and people love to, to be an expert and you can get lots of great information from them on potential risks that you might face. And uh, the risk that somebody's gonna actually take your idea and run with it and found a company and do all those steps are like, well, put them in two buckets. The benefits that you gain from talking about it are huge and the risks that you, that you face from tell, talking about it are really, really low. So you should talk about it. I, I, I take a slightly, I mean, yeah, you, you talk about it, do what you need to, but I, I'd say this, right? There's a, this, New York isn't where Boston is or Cambridge is or San Francisco is, not because there aren't a lot of people here who could potentially found companies. There's a lot of great signs all across New York, so many institutions and so forth. One of the things that I believe New York's missing is quality management teams. And what Boston can do, or Cambridge and, and San Francisco can do, is you pick a team which has worked together in a startup, that thing doesn't work, obviously you can take that team, plug them into something else. So if you have a founder who comes up with a great idea, you can find two people from somewhere who are experienced, who've done this over and over again, who can come in. What that provides also is more of a experienced objective view to the founder as they build their company. You're a scientific founder, you're attached to your project, you found friends and family who can do around, you'll find an angel who will do around, and sometimes the angel is not probably the most um, uh, 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 informed investor either. So you, you can get to a certain place, which is great, but if you have that same advice as well from someone who's been there, done this, and says, this doesn't work, and let's find a different path. I think that helps cut down on so many of things which technically, you believe, might not have needed to have gone as far as they did, right? So that's, I'm just adding to what you said, is you need not just the science, you need a partner who's been there, done that. Um, I think we're a bit over time, so thank you all for the panel.